From the boats that chug along on top of Puget Sound to the sea life that thrives down below, there's a lot of ways to measure the health of the nation's second largest marine estuary. We take a look at what's being done on land and in the depths of Puget Sound to preserve the environment and the animals that we have come to know and love. This is a State of the Sound. I'll take your boarding passes as you get on here. Please watch your step. Welcome. You can head in either side here. From a dock in Edmonds. <laughs> Good morning. Boat captain well, Brian board McGinn board. is on a mission. I'm Brian, and no, I've, I've not done this yet, but I'm excited to try it. He's a full-time whale-watching captain. Uh, this is my seventh season with these guys, so... Part-time comedian. I haven't found any whales yet, but... Um, <laughs> No, we're good. we're good. That's what happens when you have 100 tourists on board for a half a day whale watching tour. Seattle traffic, Saratoga. The excitement is palpable. I want to see that orca. <laughs> Take Margaret Brine of Florida. Free Willy was my favorite movie growing up, like Shamu. The Puget Sound Express, like many whale watching companies in the Pacific Northwest, relies on reports from a network of spotters. From there, it's a race to the potential sighting. The hunt for a glimpse of the massive mammal is on. If they go down for five minutes, you better be looking in the right place at the right time when they come back up again, so. Okay, buddy, come on, kata. Kata. Today is a good day for McGinn and his crew. I got a whale! What? An hour in and we see the distinctive tail of a humpback whale. The way that we tell humpback whales apart is usually by the markings on the underside of their tail. So we got some really great looks at Kata's uh, fluke. It's called Kata, K-A-T-A. Yes, Kata is her name. And yes, there is a record of each and every whale in the Pacific Northwest. Three o'clock, three o'clock. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go, dive in. <laughs> 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 that was so cool. This one. This exact one has been seen before. In fact, it's made the news. Tonight, federal and state officials are looking at whether this jet skier broke any laws. Back in May, we showed you this footage that was shot by a viewer. Then one of the whales comes right up to them and splashes them before diving back under the water. There. Kata, the whale, was unharmed. And today serves as a reminder of the reality we're facing. The Marine Mammal Protection Act calls for a football field between a boat and a humpback whale. Okay. Take my height and weigh that against a good sized speedboat, let's say a 20 footer, pretty big. Now compare that to a full grown orca whale. They can grow to anywhere between 20 and 28 feet. Significantly bigger though, the fully grown humpback whale, which can top out at more than 50 feet. Both populations were once hunted victims of both pollution and climate change. It just but today, according to the Pacific Whale Watching Association, the tide is turning. Today, both humpback whales and the big killer whales, their populations are both growing um, really quickly. Uh, and so in the last several years, we have been seeing more whales and there are more people going to watch whales as well. So. Oh, there he is. Humpback whales benefiting from a record baby boom in 2019. Wow. And despite new calves in recent years, the orca population in the state is still considered endangered, has been since 2005. Regardless, sightings are up. Oh, I got something. Next up on our tour, right under that seagull, yep. Our Florida couple's dream. Is anyone interested in seeing some killer whales? <gasps> A pot of orca whale. <laughs> Bye. Oh my God, killer whales! Oh my God, babe! With the whales in sight, the boat's motor is killed. Good God, he's huge. Oh my God. It's, it, it's indescribable. You dream about this moment your entire life and then it finally comes true. And you're like, you just stand there in awe. <laughs> it's just so cool. But without any harassment. Are you watching off your starboard side? Noah calling on boaters to stay 200 yards from killer whales in Washington state. Open water that can quickly become crowded. 
we're seeing a lot more transients coming in here and it's just because they have a lot of food to eat. We're seeing more and more seals and porpoise. Today, a glimpse from above water into a world that most will never see. Oh, <laughs> Keep watching out, there we go! And yes! again! Yes! A check off a bucket list for this woman. Like, my whole life is made, I can die now. Like, <laughs> I am good, I have met my spirit animal. Animals in the wild, alive and free in a quickly changing world. Life is complete. <laughs> in Edmonds. This place is absolutely beautiful. Sebastian Robertson, King 5 News. Get your last looks with these whales as we are southbound here out of Car Inlet. What a day. When Puget Sound is peaceful, it can seem to have a life of its own. But communities beyond the coastline are deeply connected by personal and policy choices that require difficult research. Okay, coming aboard. With Captain Bob Kruger and his crew. We're in uh, about 290 meters of water here. We see research to help answer how climate change and the community on the surface impacts the aquatic one below it. Phytoplankton, microbiology parameters. These scientists are using chemistry to help solve those mysteries. To make sure that things survive and thrive in the waters of the Puget Sound. On a characteristically cool, rainy Seattle day, we join them on research vessel Sound Guardian. Even its name has local ties, spun off from a local music legend. A new and very fitting name, Sound Guardian. Sound Garden helped dedicate the boat at a launch celebrating the tools it offers. We're not just bringing samples back to the lab, we're actually doing a lot of the analysis out in the field, which is something that's since I started, you know, a million years ago, it's totally changed. Channel traffic, Sound Guardian. Every two weeks, oceanographers sail to stations across the Sound and Central Basin. Going down. To drop instruments at a list of locations, including near wastewater treatment plant outfalls. We're going to collect physical samples from depths throughout the entire water column. Testing over time forms baselines for metrics like ocean acidification, temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. So we got a lot of plankton in this one. They also collect phytoplankton. This is a phytoplankton sample. They're fuel for shrimp, snails, and jellyfish, a key component of the marine food web, and an indicator of water quality. What they find in the water and phytoplankton can help them navigate what's happening. Though scientists say crunching data is complex, while it's hard to pinpoint one factor mostly responsible for changes, which can be cyclical, oceanographer Taylor Martin says changes are there, including a slight upward trend in heat. We're seeing a increase in temperature in addition to, you know, whatever other global temperature trends we're seeing both in the air and in the water. We are seeing that here in the Puget Sound too. The Sound Guardian's tools give specifics about what they're seeing. It's a super accurate temperature sensor. It's accurate to like one ten thousandth of a degree. But data is just data unless it's used to navigate future policy choices, according to King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks Director Christy True. It really becomes um, a core baseline to inform all of our decisions, especially where do we want to invest our dollars? What's going to make the biggest difference? Is it more wastewater treatment? Is it more control of stormwater? Should we be better stewards of the chemicals that we use every day? Among these scientists, there's a sense of mission to answer those questions correctly. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to spend time in or around the waters of the Puget Sound and preserving that for future generations is a, a key interest of mine as well as my colleagues. And for all of us on shore, there are choices about the chemicals we use and the cleanup we do that can help us play a role. It's really important that the that whole system is, is very healthy and that we're prepared for changes as climate change comes in too is going to change the water quality of Puget Sound and we want to make sure that our shorelines have lots of habitat for all of these things to live. Because even as the Sound Guardian monitors what's happening, it's on all of us to keep watch and guard the water's health for all that rely on it. From Puget Sound, Eric Zuko, King 5 News.
The Northwest is rich with acres of lush evergreen trees that you can see. But beneath the waters of Puget Sound, there's another kind of forest that most of us don't ever see. When we think about forests, most people are thinking about terrestrial forests, right? Okay, but these are underwater forests that are doing incredible work in terms of absorbing carbon dioxide, turning it into food that supports us. She's talking about bull kelp, a seaweed that is as hardworking as it is in trouble. We are definitely seeing declines in kelp forests in parts of Puget Sound. Betsy Peabody heads the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, a nonprofit dedicated to recovering the marine life of the sound. Kelp matters, she says, because when they decline, so do the creatures and marine ecosystems rely on, including the seafood that we eat. The Southern Sound has seen an 80% loss in bull kelp forests in the last 50 years, according to the fund. In the Central Sound, there are places where kelp forests have disappeared entirely around Bainbridge Island. So clearly there's a connection between places where kelp forests can thrive and places where maybe the temperature is too warm. With the support of the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, the group launched a new project to try to figure out why. A kelp monitoring program will expand to 14 stations throughout the Sound from the Strait of Juan de Fuca to Squaxin Island near Olympia. Peabody says kelp research has been limited to observations at the surface level. This time we're going to be doing underwater ecological monitoring with divers. Problem is they need divers. And that's where Brad Giles comes into play. I'm just a recreational diver who loves the underwater world. Giles owns a dive shop in Marysville. He heard about the kelp monitoring project through the Reef Check Foundation. Two meters by 30 meters. The group that's training volunteer divers to be underwater scientists. You ready to do it? Yeah. Okay. Gathering measurements, water temperature, and pictures of the creatures they see. Giles signed up. I felt you know, this is an opportunity that I can get out here and give back into the dive community and to the community in general. On a chilly day in late April, they geared up. The nice signal for air like this. For training at Kameno Island State Park, a spot where kelp uniquely grows all year round. Giles and his diving partner cross a rocky beach. It's beautiful above water and it's beautiful below water. And walk straight into the choppy water. Toward a vision that Giles says is incomparable. The underwater world is so beautiful here. You know, we're so fortunate in Washington that we have just this beautiful landscape. Not just anyone can get into this water like these experienced divers can. They are essentially the eyes of this important research to provide critical data and images. Data that is passed on to the Puget Sound Restoration Fund's research. This is a way to get them involved in monitoring those kelp forests in a systematic way using the same protocols that our scientific divers use. After an hour or so, they're back. This is awesome. This is really cool. The kelp monitoring project will go on for at least three years, and with the eyes of these ordinary divers, they hope to learn something extraordinary. And if we're not watching, we're not going to see what actions we need to be taking. These kelp beds waiting in the silent waters to be rescued. On Camino Island, Christine Pei, King 5 News. A city shaped by water is inspiration for innovation. This can be the boat that achieves everything that people set out to do on the water. Enhancing an experience. When I hit the acceleration with the electric motors, you'll just feel it take off on you. Seattle is a place where Andy Rebelly sees opportunity. It's bringing boats back to where they should be. Meet the Pure Pontoon Boat, manufactured by Seattle-based Pure Watercraft. I started this company to build the product that I really wanted. Reveille leads the company headquartered on the shore of Lake Union. This boat's engine is completely electric, meaning no fuel, no emissions. There are two things people notice. They can't hear it and they can't see the outboard motor. It's an industry taking off. Pure Watercraft is building a facility in Tukwila to manufacture boats and outboard motors. 
It recently received a $150 million investment from car manufacturer General Motors, the largest investment a company has ever made in electric boating. Seattle's really at the forefront of making this transformation. Do you think that there's a case for that? Seattle certainly is in the center of it, and it should be in the center of it. We've got water flowing through the center of our city. Department of Ecology records show since 2015, recreational vessels have spilled nearly 15,000 gallons of fuel. However, the department believes there are many spills not reported, meaning the number is likely higher. The drops and the cup here and the cup there, they add up. That never goes away. Aaron Barnett runs Washington Sea Grant. They study the challenges facing Washington's ocean and coasts. One of the key jobs is to educate recreational boaters about small oil spills, a problem eliminated by electric motors. It's a step in the right direction. What do you mean by that, the right direction? When I say right direction, I mean using technology that's more efficient, that's more applicable, that makes more sense, that doesn't create the impacts that we see with oil spill discharge. <laughs> Ravelli says right now pontoons are the most popular boat on the market. Pure Watercraft's electric motor is designed to have enough charge to enjoy a day on the water. Dual motors allow it to travel up to 23 miles per hour. However, electrification isn't for everything. Battery technology can be large and relies on predictable schedules to ensure there's time to recharge. A really good fit for electric propulsion is something that does a regular run of a fixed length. What Reveille is describing is something on a predictable set schedule, like the Washington State Ferry System. It's one of the larger consumers of fuel on Washington's water. It's an ideal system for electrification. Innovation, I think, now is a necessity. We have a real opportunity to make an impact here, setting an example for the rest of the country. Since 2017, Matt Von Ruden and his team have been working to transform Washington State ferries, which use 19 million gallons of diesel every year. Much of the change will happen deep inside the vessel's engine, which is so loud you have to wear hearing protection. This is one of two propulsion motors. What we want to do is replace two of the four diesel engines with big battery banks drive them like a hybrid vehicle and eventually bring electricity from the shore and charge the batteries that way. Funding of $1.3 billion launched two projects. The first builds new hybrid electric vessels. The second transforms the state's largest ships, which travel between Seattle, Bainbridge and Bremerton into hybrid vessels. We think 95% of the time we'll be running in battery electric mode. So no diesel exhaust. No rumbling noises of the engine, it'll be electric. Here's a look at how the battery, which will be much quieter, will get power. Von Ruden calls it a robotic arm. We need to bring the electricity from these black structures to the vessel. It will be at the dock and plug into the ship as passengers get on and off. For us, it's just the perfect situation because from the mountains, we have hydroelectric power, renewable electricity. And so that's what kind of all comes together. The maturity of the lithium ion batteries, availability of the renewable electricity, and then the distance is about right where even for our Seattle the Bremerton run it's achievable. The innovation is pushing boating into the future one with less noise cleaner water and air. The reasons people go out on a boat they want to connect with nature and they want to connect with family and friends. They don't want to go out and do harm to the environment they want to connect with it and this is a better way to connect with nature than any other boat before. Callie Greenberg King 5 News.